Good morning and welcome to the Alabama Works webinar series, a monthly webinar designed to provide information and speakers related to the workforce in Alabama. Past webinars are available on the Alabama Works website at alabamaworks.com. And now your host, Tim McCartney, Chair of the Alabama Workforce Council. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the October 2022 Alabama Workforce Council monthly webinar. Today, we have a really action-packed lineup of four speakers who are gonna cover a lot of ground fairly quickly, so, so listen up. Our first speaker this morning was Mr. Tyler Barnett, who is the CEO of New Schools for Alabama. He's going to join us to discuss charter schools in our state. The next speaker will be Dr. Corey Perdue, who is the Director of Professional Education at UAB's Colette School of Business, and she's going to discuss career pathways. Following her, we'll have Mr. Josh Laney, who is the director of the Alabama Office of Apprenticeship. And Josh is going to provide an update on our apprenticeship program in Alabama. Uh, next will be Mr. Neil Wade, who's known to a lot of us in Alabama for his past success. And he's uh, joining us as the chairman of the board of the Path to Success Foundation. He's going to give us a preview of, of the foundation. And after that, Nick Moore will join us from the governor's office to give us the monthly labor update. So without further ado, Mr. Barnett, you, you have the floor. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Tyler Barnett. I'm the CEO of New Schools for Alabama. Thanks so much for having me this morning. I'm gonna pop up my slides here. And thanks also uh, to Nick Moore for inviting me to, to join you all this morning. Really appreciate the opportunity. Okay. Um, okay, so New Schools for Alabama, a little bit about us as an organization. Um, New Schools for Alabama is a nonprofit organization uh, designed to support the, the charter school movement in the state of Alabama. Our mission is to support the growth of excellent charter schools in Alabama to ensure that every child has access to a quality public education. We work with districts and charter schools alike. Uh, we work with legislators and administrative agencies to create a policy environment that supports the growth of, of charter schools in Alabama uh, and holds them accountable for their performance. Uh, so why do we do what we do? There are a few reasons. Uh, one is we simply believe that every child deserves uh, to attend a high quality school that provides a safe and supportive environment and fosters their academic growth. And currently too many kids in our state uh, don't have access to such a school. We don't believe charter schools are any sort of a, a panacea to our educational problems and challenges, but we do believe that they need to be a part of the solution. Uh, the second reason is that we believe Alabama needs a catalyst of change and charter schools are an excellent source to explore the effectiveness of new models. And as an organization, we don't, we don't really view education in a vacuum. Uh, we know that it has a direct correlation to an impact on uh, the quality of life that a child has access to after high school. Uh, and we also know that it's cyclical. So we, we believe we have to do something different. And the, uh, the mechanism that we work with to do that is the charter school movement. Uh, and unfortunately, Alabama's academic uh, underperformance disproportionately affects low-income students in our state and students of color. Uh, so that's the population that most of our charter schools are serving. Uh, why charter schools? So the data shows that charter schools writ large nationally, this is the, these are the results of a, a significant national study, have a net positive impact on student learning with a really significant gain, especially for low-income students and students of color. So again, it's no surprise that most charter schools in our state serve higher percentages of low-income students and students of color. Um, so just a basic charter school 101, what charter schools are for anybody who, who's not uh, super familiar. Uh, charter schools are public schools. They are tuition-free schools, just like any other public school. Uh, they're operated by an independent governing board that is distinct from the district's school board. Uh, they have greater flexibility in exchange for greater accountability. Uh, and then they're also open enrollment, meaning uh, that there is not a, a zoned enrollment, generally speaking, for charter schools. 
uh, out, except for uh, charter schools that are located within a specific district, students that are residents of that district uh, essentially get first crack at enrolling in the school. If the school doesn't uh, meet full capacity with the kids in that district, then kids from outside the district can enroll. Uh, and essentially, uh, the grand bargain of charter schools is that they give parents the opportunity to choose the public school that's right for their child. So at New Schools for Alabama, the way we support this movement is we have what we call our four strategic pillars. Uh, one of those is new school development, another is technical assistance, community engagement, and policy advancement. Uh, new school development, we are supporting uh, schools that are interested in growing in Alabama that meet a certain threshold of quality and show early on that they have a likelihood of success. Uh, and we work with those schools selectively we also provide robust technical assistance to, school, uh, to schools that exist in the state to ensure that they have what they need to succeed. Uh, and that looks like everything from, uh, you know, doing their uh, sort of back office work, accounting, bookkeeping, payroll, that sort of stuff. Some of the, the nitty gritty work of schools that doesn't often get celebrated, all the way down to helping them select quality curricula, providing training on instruction and leadership. Um, and then we also work with community organizations in various parts of the state uh, to make sure that uh, parents and advocates are well informed uh, and, and that they have what they need to be able to organize themselves to get their schools off the ground. Uh, we are also the largest grant maker uh, for charter schools in the state. We make grants to charter schools and traditional districts that are interested in doing innovative work. To date, we've made about $19 million in grants here in the last four years. 12 of those are federal grants. Uh, so we have a large federal grant that we're able to administer to support the growth of quality charter schools. We've also made eight fellowship grants. So we do an, uh, an annual year long fellowship for high quality, uh, high caliber leaders that are interested in launching schools in their community. Uh, and then we've given out five discretionary grants. Some of those are to, to districts. Some of those are to charter schools to support innovative work. And actually, I should call out one of the uh, 12 CSP grants that you see on the screen is also to a district uh, in, in Montgomery. So a brief history of the charter school movement. So you all can kind of see you know, where we are today and where we've come from. The charter school movement in Alabama is really in its infancy. Uh, charter schools around the country have really existed since 1992, but we're pretty late to the game in Alabama. That has pretty significant benefits for us as well. Uh, we're able to learn from uh, past experiences of other states. We didn't pass our charter school law in this state until 2015, which is the enabling uh, legislation for charter schools. The first school opened in 2017-18, and that was in uh, Mobile, and that's the Excel Day and Evening Academy. We'll learn a little bit more about that momentarily. Uh, and then in 1819, we added a school. 1920, two more schools in Montgomery and Birmingham. And then it's just grown since. And today we sit at 13 schools across the state with a concentration primarily in the Birmingham area and the Montgomery area. Uh, enrollment has also increased significantly since the inception of the charter school movement. We started with about 250 kids in the 2017-18 school year. And this year, we haven't seen the October enrollment data, the, the average daily membership uh, that the, the state uses for uh, student headcount in districts. But we anticipate that it'll be somewhere around 5,000 to 5,500 kids across the, across the state. So it's a pretty significant uptick. And I should also add that that, that, doesn't, uh, that data does not capture the over 1,000 students that are on wait lists to get in charter schools. So one of, the, uh, one of the concepts of a charter school for the enrollment process is that it is open, but if you are oversubscribed for the number of seats you have, you have to go into a lottery process. And in that lottery process, if you have 500 seats, 500 kids will be randomly selected to get into that school, any kids above that 500 are put on what's called a wait list. So there are about a thousand kids across the state trying to get into charter schools today. The demographics, as I mentioned earlier, uh, currently outpace in terms of uh, student poverty and students of color. Uh, the, the state averages it's about 70% of the kids enrolled in charter schools across the state are economically disadvantaged, which is a term of art the state uses. Uh, that's uh, not directly commensurate with free and reduced lunch, but is um, that's a part of the calculus. 
uh, compared to about 44% across the state, uh, and then uh, 83% of students enrolled in charter schools are students of color compared to 47%. And then special education population is roughly similar with 11% in charter schools, 13% in uh, traditional districts across the state. So where do charter schools intersect with uh, workforce development? Specifically, charter schools have uh, a number of um, opportunities for flexibility that traditional districts actually do have access to, but some are just not taking advantage of. And there is a process by which many of them uh, have, to, uh, have to seek uh, flexibility to take advantage of, of some of these uh, essentially waivers. Um, but uh, not only right now are charter schools employing over 400 individuals across the state, but they're also given professionals that uh, may not have traditional teacher training the opportunity to teach and to share the industry expertise they may have with students. So for example, uh, we have teachers with advanced degrees in neuroscience teaching in charter schools, advanced degrees in aviation, teaching biology and aviation courses. And that's possible because of the flexibility around certification and the schools are providing pedagogical support to those teachers to get them ready to lead their classrooms. Many of them are also seeking uh, alternative certification and, and things like that. Um, Charter schools also have flexibility around the curriculum that they implement. Uh, so that allows schools to implement new coursework and to partner with industry leaders to implement new curricula that, that aligns with industry standards and therefore better prepares students to enter that specific workforce area upon graduation. We'll see a couple examples of these uh, momentarily, but these are a few areas uh, of many that charter schools have flexibility around that really allow them to uh, really amplify and enhance the work of, of workforce development, especially at the K-12 grade levels uh, in this state. And then finally, charter schools have flexibility around scheduling, and many are taking advantage of this. Uh, again, we'll see a few of them here in just a moment, but specifically several are implementing uh, what we would call a hybrid learning, uh, learning model where students are at the school for part of the day and participating in field experience with an industry partner in another part of the day. And the idea is that that would eventually lead to a credit bearing internship that aligns with uh, their K-12 graduation requirements. Some cases may align even with some form of dual enrollment. Um, and the idea behind all of this is to equip kids to succeed after high school. So a couple of examples, I'm gonna highlight uh, three specifically. One is that first school that existed in the state, that's Excel Day and Evening Academy in Mobile. Another is a newer school, that's the Alabama Aerospace and Aviation High School in Bessemer. And then the third is University Charter School in Livingston on the, uh, the western border of the state. So quickly on Excel, uh, Excel is one of those that is implementing this hybrid learning environment that I mentioned. Uh, and so what students are getting in this experience is the in-person support that they really need to succeed at the school while they're engaged in some form of credit recovery. Because the mission of Excel is to serve overaged, undercredited kids, many kids who are at risk of dropping out. That's the typical student profile that they work with. Uh, in some states, this would be called a, uh, called a dropout recovery program. Uh, and the, so while some of those kids are, while those kids are getting this in-person support at the school, many of them are also completing remote work at home that may lead them to finalizing their testing requirements at the school site to pass a specific course. And that sort of hybrid environment where they may have some uh, sort of technology-driven instruction supported by in-person facilitation, uh, that really allows them to leverage flexibility in their scheduling to be doing some internship work uh, during the other part of the day. So uh, every student has to complete these career exploration requirements. And then for part of the day, they're engaged in a credit bearing internship. And some of those are actually paid internships. And so that is mutually beneficial, not only to the school uh, and the students at the school, but also to the employers who are uh, essentially using the school to create this pipeline of uh, potential um, ready-made workforce when students graduate. Another is Alabama Aerospace and Aviation High School. This is, again, this is a newer school just opened this year. And at that school, we actually have a kid, uh, a few kids, 
who are already uh, on track to complete their to, to obtain their pilot's license. Uh, that's a high school, specifically grades nine through 12. This year, they're serving ninth and 10th graders. Um, and in this school, every single kid will uh, will graduate with some sort of credential, either a, uh, a an individual private pilot's license with a track to a commercial pilot's license or a certificate in aviation mechanics with a track to employment in the Delta Ops program with Delta Airlines upon graduation to become an aviation mechanic. Uh, and so some of their partners include Delta Airlines, Kaiser Holdings, uh, Auburn Aviation and the Bessemer Airport. And the whole, the whole um, underpinning of this is to increase representation of black and brown kids in the Air Force and aviation industry, um, and also to partner with uh, industry leaders like Delta Airlines to get an earlier ready-made workforce that can, can, can fuel their needs as well. So again, a mutually beneficial opportunity. And then finally, University Charter School. This one's a little bit different. Uh, this is a lab school. It's located on the University of West Alabama campus. And at that school, uh, teachers who are in their uh, college of education, teachers in training, work simultaneously at the school, uh, not typically as a lead teacher in a classroom, but as a supporting teacher in a classroom. So they're gaining all of their, their clinical experience that's required to get, graduate, but they're also uh, gaining uh, much, much more than that because they're in the school full time as either a, a support teacher or some sort of para professional while they're obtaining their teaching degree at the University of West Alabama. Um, another sort of theoretical underpinning of this is uh, to support the community of Livingston, Alabama, to make sure that more graduates of the schools in Livingston do not flee Livingston to go seek employment elsewhere, but rather they have an opportunity to come back, uh, maintain a high qualify, highly qualified workforce uh, in the Livingston community and, and to uh, return to that community to, to live. I wanna quickly just highlight a couple of future opportunities that we see. Those were some key examples. And um, I think there are some really significant uh, pathways here to, uh, to leverage the flexibility that the charter school law allows to do more of this sort of workforce development uh, work early on that benefits kids and, uh, and communities and employers. So one is the conversion charter school process. We have one district that is leveraging the conversion charter school mechanism, it has three charter schools, uh, three schools that they've converted to charter schools. But what that affords is additional flexibility to the district. They can use this place-based approach to develop these industry partnerships with local businesses, much like we've seen from some of these charter schools. And we're seeing a lot of this in other states. We just haven't quite gotten there yet. And I think there's a real opportunity there. And then finally, this higher ed partnership opportunity. Uh, I think you know it gives institutions of higher education a uh, real opportunity to create these mission-aligned K-12 feeder campuses um, that give kids access to you know, dual enrollment, early exposure to post-secondary life. Um, and, uh, and, and those are some opportunities that we think are growing in the state, but we'd like to see taken advantage of a little bit more. And that's it. Thank you, Tyler. That was very, very interesting. Uh -oh. Okay, I was on mute. Sorry about that, Tyler. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation. We appreciate that. And uh, uh, I've got a lot of questions for you. I'll ask you later, though. So uh, next up, we've got Dr. Corey Perdue, who's Director of Professional Education at UAB's Colat School of Business. Uh, Corey, take it away. Good morning. If I have had the pleasure of meeting you before, I am Corey Perdue. Director of Professional Education. And for some of you that have been in our new building, um, it opened four years ago, and we opened a professional education office. And in that office, we are working to create new career pathways for people in Alabama. And this is not directly related with our undergraduate degrees or our graduate degrees. Um, this is for any professionals. They don't have to have a degree, um, but they could have 
higher degrees. Um, we have a very large range of professional courses that we are offering and we are actively developing um, a lot more. So these are five main areas that professional education is working in. I'm gonna concentrate mostly on this first one of our career advancement short courses. Um, but so that you know, we also offer custom corporate training. I was out last week, three days in the woods um, at the 4-H Center in Columbia and Alabama with over a hundred emerging leaders at a local company um, doing leadership training and building up those new leaders um, for that company. And it was a lot of fun seeing people 30 feet in the air doing ropes courses together and learning um, and getting over some fears. Um, we also have a talent discovery center that we're launching this fall for employees um, to come in and get full assessments on how well they handle stress, how well they can problem solve, how they work in teams. Um, and we can provide a third party picture back to um, leaders of what we're seeing in specific individuals. Our core four development, our fourth category here is four Fridays for four hours on four main topics. They will, the topics do alternate, um, but if we do leadership, um, we'll really go in on four core um, areas to focus on and those will change to project management and different things. And our leadership consortium where we have non-competing businesses, um, their C-suites coming in together to learn not only from our faculty and our experts, but to learn from each other and to really leverage um, ideas that are you know, really hitting home here in Alabama. So let's look at our career advancement courses. We offer courses that are both asynchronous, work at your own pace, we have synchronous options with a cohort model that are very successful and, you know, professionals are busy. So sometimes they want to work at their own pace and sometimes they want to feel like they're in a classroom and work with other people in a live setting. We have face-to-face -face classes. We have live online classes and professionals are really doing a great job of turning the live classroom into um, very engaging opportunities. And just like we're doing today, we have this webinar. Um, if we had our course online, we'd have lots of breakouts, interactive polls. Um, and people have said on our evaluations, you know, it felt like I was in a real classroom and we really try to get them into that mindset. Some of the um, really benefits are our courses are easy to register. There's no admission process to UAB. You can register in five minutes if you'd like. A lot of the courses are stackable. So one example is someone tells me they're interested in cybersecurity, but they don't really know how much they're interested in it. We can offer just an introduction to cybersecurity course where they're getting their feet wet, they're learning an overview, um, but they're not committing to a, a really long course. If they really um, think that that is an area that they wanna develop more in, they can then stack additional courses um, directly to that. We have um, badges and some of our courses are credit awarding while we're not necessarily in the undergraduate or graduate um, side of the house here in Collapse for Business. You can take some of the courses and earn credit. Fully accessible, um, very interactive. These are not courses, especially if you take your work at your own pace courses that you can just click a video and leave. <laughs> you have to be there and you have to be doing the work. Um, they've been uh, vetted out by our faculty and developed to make sure that real tangible skills are being learned, um, assessments, games, um, what, short videos to watch, but still very interactive. Expert supported, students can always um, have the option to reach out to a faculty member. We'd say in 24 hours, we'll, within 24 hours, we'll get back to you with specific questions, you can sign up um, and also have one-on-one -on -one time with professors, a lot of good quality video content. And we can customize these, customize these courses. So we have a lot of modules built out in specific things like banking, finance, accounting. But if you wanted someone to really understand how to be a teller in a bank and you had specific um, 
things you wanted that to learn, we can build that into the course seamlessly. And that is something we're really working on right now is finding those pain points in businesses and with specific um, careers right now of, okay, they need to have these basic skills, but then they need to have these specialized skills for this specific career. And we um, are always looking for the opportunity to build those. So here are just a few of the categories. Um, we are known for our project management courses. We're an authorized training provider for PMI Global. And I'll talk a little bit more about, about that in a minute. But we do a lot of sales and negotiation training. Um, anything um, from data analytics to digital marketing to leadership, um, we are working on it and have programs. So let's look just a minute at a couple of our certificates. So this is one of our certificates in digital marketing. If you look at the bottom, it takes about 30 hours to complete the whole certificate. You could just start and take one of these short courses, which would take just a couple hours to complete. So let's say, you know, you want to know a little bit more about content marketing. You could start at content, content marketing, take that and say, oh, okay, that's for me. I want to do that. And then you can pick other things along the way. Um, and if you were to complete all of these short courses, you would then earn a certificate in digital marketing. You would have industry certifications at the end as well with Google Analytics and HubSpot inbound marketing. So there are industry certifications that come along with a lot of these as well. Let's look at another course. This one is a short course on computer office skills. And we realize we need to have career pathways um, for all levels. So if you wanted um, administrative assistants or secretaries just to get some more information about PowerPoint or Excel, we have a lot of different reasons people need to catch up on you know, all the new formulas in Excel. You can take these as well on your own time and earn certificates along the way to show that you are you know, really proficient in these areas. And another is our data analytics. Everyone has so much data right now. What do you do with it? Um, you have to be able to turn it into um, readable data and be able to understand how it is affecting um, real world decisions. And this course really sets the stage for that. The introduction part is really helpful for people just to wrap their mind around it. Where a lot of times I think we have the buzzwords of you no know, data analytics, and even no business analytics, but really understanding what that is and then understanding the tools of how to use it. And then also how to share those, um, the analytics that you actually create using things like Tableau mm -hmm. and then being able to share it in, in a way where people in your company will understand it. Here, just a quick few more financial math basics. Just if you wanted people to be able to understand sales tax better or understand how different parts of accounting or finance work, this is a great um, start. We also have a retail math basics course and that can build on um, and you can add other things to it. Supply chain basics. Of course, we're dealing with um, a lot of supply chain management issues. And this course would help people understand some of the challenges and be able to problem solve and think through, you know, how can I perhaps solve this problem in a new way? Other certificates we offer are in HR management. Um, and then on the, on the right, you'll see other learning categories. So we have a lot more courses than just the ones I'm showing you right now. And we're actively look, um, we're actively working with people to design new courses, keeping them up to date and making sure um, that these are relevant, tangible certifications um, for people who are in the workforce, who want to upskill, who maybe are rejoining the workforce, um, all different levels. We have a lot of people who you know, are retired and they want to go for another um, new career and they can come and take some of our introduction courses and say, oh, I want to be in marketing, or maybe I want to be in management and being able to see them 
really find the right fit for them is exciting. So I mentioned this before, but our project management courses, we actually, it predates um, this building. We've been offering project management courses even before this office opened, but we have built out new courses where we realize not everyone has the experience to sit for the PMP test just yet. You have to have three years of experience to even be able to sit for the PMP. So we have pathways into project management where you can take introduction courses, understand you know, what is a project, what does that look like? It needs to be unique and have a start date and an end date and understand all the phases of a project. And a lot of people are, I don't know, sometimes switching into project management because they realize how much they really enjoy this. Um, and by taking that introduction course, they understand what type of experience they should get in order to work towards something like your CAPM or your PMP or your Agile ACP certification. And you can earn your experience doing volunteer work or working for nonprofits. And a lot of times people can be earning that experience while they're also um, having a full-time job and then they can continue to move into um, being a project manager in a few years. These courses typically are live cohorts, either live online or here in the Clark School of Business. We, because we are a PMI authorized training provider, they are mandatory that they have to have live contact hours. Um, but you can get through these courses in four to eight weeks. And people get jobs while they take the courses. We had one person who earned their PMP and they put it on their resume and that same job, same day they had three job offers. And I think you probably know that there are a lot of open positions right now for project managers. So let's think about the workforce. We've asked our UAB seniors, this new generation, I have four kids myself. One is a UAB student and a high school, two high schoolers and a third grader. And they're a little bit different than, um, other generations. One, a few things that really stand out to the workforce coming up is that they want jobs that have purpose. They want jobs that, that excite them, that challenge them, and they want to enhance their talents and their skills. And they'll, they're willing to job hop, which, you know, a lot of other generations weren't really wanting to do that. You find a job and you stick with it for a, a very long time. And they want to this generation really wants to continue to learn and grow. So my question to you is, when you have people coming in to get a job and they're sitting with your HR manager and the HR manager asks them a lot of questions about why they want this job, if the tables were turned and they come back and they go, okay, if I get this job, how are you going to help me learn and grow? Would your HR managers be ready and would they have a really solid understanding of how your company can really get those talents and refine them and help people find that extra spark and passion in specific things. And that's something that we really are striving to do here in Platt School of Business is to empower corporations, empower individuals to meet learners where they're at and then help them find that pathway to that career that really excites them. So there are programs, we do a lot of assessments. We have very, um, I would say very good quality programs. We do evaluations and we always ask, would you recommend this course to someone else? And as you can see, we have very strong data. This is just an example of some of our courses over a year. And how were they satisfied this the course strongly agree. I always like asking people the question, um, did the course meet your expectations, exceed your expectations or far exceed your expectations? And of course you have the lower, didn't meet expectations. And I'm always overjoyed to see how many far exceed their expectations. Just real quickly, um, getting back out to that 4-H center idea of ropes courses and kind of out of the ordinary corporate academies. We were, one example is we did a live online corporate academy during COVID. Everybody was on Zoom. 
We had originally planned it for May of 2020, and it was supposed to be in person here on the practice football field right behind me um, from Palat. And we turned it into a virtual training and put people into teams, turned Zoom into, I would say, like a national security board where we gave them maps and different ideas and gave them a challenge. We had a real person out in the middle of New Mexico. We told them they were in some foreign desert and they had to help our agent 008 get through um, a series of obstacles. And they worked as teams in Zoom, you know, to choose, okay, you can only take four items, why? And really doing some creative leadership, innovative training um, in all kinds of different ways. So here's the big corporate dilemma. What if we train them and they leave? Well, <laughs> what if you don't train them and they stay? I would argue that it's very important right now to find people from within your corporations to take that next step and to move on. And a lot of times employers, um, when they really take the time to understand their employees and thinking about the pains that they have and the skill gaps and building into them, you're gonna build loyalty, um, redu reduce your turnover rates. Um, and you know, if you train them up and they leave, they're gonna have a great um, job somewhere else. That's that you should, we should be happy for them that they are developing that. But I think also as we develop them, they really, um, take that loyalty to heart and appreciate it. So I'm gonna end with a one minute video and I'll warn you, um, there's a moment in here where you might get a little wheezy because you'll be on one of um, our giant swing obstacles. The time for professional education is now. Constant changes in technology and the economy have reshaped the job market and the need for training is more important than ever. Relevant work-related training is what we do. We help professionals and corporate partners take the next step. We create training and development that inspires individuals and reinvents the workplace culture. We encourage leaders to embrace continuous learning and to unleash the true potential of their employees. We help you find their own greatness within. We draw on the expertise of UAB faculty and industry experts to develop and deliver engaging, transformational self-discovery and learning. The time is now. Well, I appreciate your time and I would love the opportunity to um, talk with any of you, I'll show you around the Collapse School of Business if you haven't been here before, and please reach out to me with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perdue. Uh, very interesting uh, program we presented. Career Pathways plays an important role to support workers as they transition from the education to the workforce. Very important subject. Thank you so much. Uh, Josh, you're, you can take it from here. All right, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, Dr. Purdue, you had me right up to the point it looked like you dropped somebody out of a tree. Um, I, I think I'm gonna we'll pass on that. <laughs> we'll take the other version of the workshop. So um, good morning, everybody. I'm Josh Laney. I'm the uh, director of the Alabama Office of Apprenticeship, and I'm just gonna bring you a few uh, updates this morning about our office and some of the work we've got going on, some of the interesting activities that uh, you might wanna, wanna hear about. First, just some uh, general updates about uh, apprenticeship in Alabama. Uh, we just heard about work-based learning and we just heard about the retention and the 
uh, recruitment activities uh, that are going on with the Collat School, and uh, we've heard about the challenges of uh, teacher programs uh, from Mr. Wade earlier, so um, we're hitting right on those exact topics here. Um, we have uh, 133 sponsors now operating in the state. A sponsor is a, a body that organizes and runs an apprenticeship program. Could be an individual uh, employer or some kind of organization that's running a group program. Uh, you'll see that we have 494 employers now actively participating. So since the time we were created, we've said that was our top line metric is the number of employers that we can serve. Uh, so we're getting close to breaking 500 employers uh, signed up for the first time. We'll be there, I really believe, within, before the end of this month, probably, uh, because of one of the particular programs we're doing. Uh, so that, that's really big for us, that we're really meeting the needs of employers. <laughs> Excuse me, I was in uh, Birmingham last week. We met with a group of employers and, and uh, in a, in a uh, board meeting of sorts, and one of the employers there uh, was from a small company. They said, you know, I, we need we need one or two people. Y'all probably don't work with us, right? Um, you know, the other that one of the other companies in the room was Regions Bank, and so they were. You really want to work with them, right? Not not necessarily with us. We need one or two, and that's not the way we operate. Um, our top line metric is employers serve, and so for us, it is just as important to meet the needs of that employer who needs one or two people as it is to meet the needs of that employer that needs fifty or sixty or a hundred people. Um, and that's because in, in a lot of cases, the one or two people that that small business needs are as critical or more critically important to maintaining their business as the 50 that would be at a large company. So we exert the same amount of effort, uh, no matter what size it is. Uh, you'll see out of that 2,917 2, apprentices, and then you see this really uh, kind of cheesy 10% in, in uh, fireworks right there. That 10% is the number or the percentage of female participants that we have in registered apprenticeship now. We broke that 10% a couple of months ago. That was the first time that uh, Alabama had ever had double digit female participation in registered apprenticeship. Uh, when we took over management from the US Department of Labor in March of 2020, um, our apprenticeships were and, and still are overwhelmingly um, white and male. And that's just not representative of our state. And so one of our primary goals is to make sure that we diversify the occupations that are being trained and the people that are being able to take advantage of registered apprenticeship in the state. So we were proud to see that we're making granted incremental progress, but at least progress in diversifying the people that are able to participate and take advantage of everything that registered apprenticeship has to offer. I love the little cartoon that Dr. Purdue had up about uh, what if I invest in them and train them and then they leave. Uh, well, I, that's what we're, that's the ultimate uh, explanation that we're making for apprentice uh, employers. That, that's, that's a question we get a lot. Why would I want to invest in, in registered apprenticeship? Why would I want to invest in these people? What if they turn around and leave me? And it's the same answer. I mean, would you rather have somebody working for you that nobody else wants? Um, yeah, that, that's not what you're after. And if you treat people well, you invest in them, you train them up, they're going to stay. Uh, registered apprenticeship non, um, nationally shows a retention rate over 90% uh, two years after completion of the apprenticeship. So no other form of, of uh, training of any kind has that kind of retention rate. We haven't been doing it quite long enough yet in Alabama to start being able to keep up with those numbers ourselves, but we believe we'll at least match those kind of percentages. So if you invest in your people, you train them up, you get not only the skills that you need as an employer, but you also get an employee who has got a relationship with you and is going to stay and be invested in the long term. One of our uh, really uh, probably our fastest growing apprenticeship program that we've <laughs> ever done or, or even thought about is in healthcare. We were able to create a registered apprenticeship program in nursing for LPNs and RNs. Um, this was driven by the needs of our employers. So our Alabama Nursing Home Association the Alabama Hospital Association and tons of individual employers were just crying out about this uh, shortage in the skilled nursing trades. Um, and so we, we worked with the Alabama Board of Nursing, the community college system office, uh, played a critical role in developing the nation's first registered apprenticeship for LPNs and RNs. And so we have uh, now launched that. The first cohort took off this June. Uh, Coastal Alabama Community College and Gadsden Community College launched two uh, small cohorts this summer, and both of those went out. And then just as soon as they were out, when Meredith Smith, my statewide project manager, is handling this particular program. And every 
single day. We have new companies and new employers being added to this. Um, it's offering a real new path uh, for training nurses in our state, and we believe is going to be a game changer. It's really going to shift the, the way that training nurses is done. Um, it doesn't take anything away from the existing nursing schools. In fact, really the main thing it does is just add a much longer period of on-the-job learning and convert that long on-the-job learning period into paid work experience so that a nursing student doesn't have to work two or three shifts at the Taco Bell to try to survive. They're able to work at the hospital under the direct supervision of their mentor in their field of study. We also believe that's going to help them uh, perform better in their coursework. So those are taken off everywhere. You'll see uh, just about every week we've got a signing day somewhere. Uh, we were at Jeff State last week launching their program. Uh, we also were able to launch the first four-year program uh, back in, in uh, just the end of September at uh, Auburn University for a nursing apprenticeship. So the last two years of your four-year nursing degree are a registered apprenticeship. And uh, it, was, it was great to be able to bring a um, number one in the nation for something to Auburn. I'm um, not going to see very many of those in, in other activities going on right now, but uh, we were super glad to be able to, to do that. And, uh, and that's a game changer for them because we've got, it was beautiful, the, the first batch of apprentices that were there, it was seven apprentices, not a whole lot in this first little batch. They're working with East Alabama Medical Center. Um, and out of that batch of seven, we had a single mother who was trying to figure out how to continue to pay for her nursing school. We had a married uh, pair of veterans who between them have five kids of their own. So these, these apprenticeships are um, allowing people who are not the, the fresh out of college, mama's paying my bill folks. These are for real Alabamians, those people who have been the ones we're trying to get in off of the sidelines of our workforce so we can continue to work on our labor market participation rate, uh, which I'm sure Nick will talk about later. We're really, really meeting the needs of that group of people and we think that that's a population that can jump into healthcare and make a big difference in our state. We've got now 12 different sponsors doing that, about 55 or 60, and I say about 55 or 60 employers because I literally can't keep up with how fast we're adding them. But that's everybody from long-term care facilities, nursing homes, hospitals, and they're doing some really innovative work to make sure that these programs uh, are meeting the needs of the students, but also giving us an extremely well-trained and high-qualified uh, nurse when they're completing that program. So super excited about that program. We also have, and I've heard a, a bit of discussion this morning about uh, charter schools and teacher shortages. And um, we talked about uh, how we're trying to offer the opportunity for, I guess you'd call typically non-traditional teachers to get into the uh, teaching profession. We are in the initial stages. If you pay any attention at all to teacher uh, development across the country, teacher apprenticeship is the, the hot new topic. Um, everybody is trying to build out a teacher apprenticeship program. Uh, we're taking what I would call a measured approach to try to get it right and build it in a sustainable way. Um, I'm not throwing rocks or shade at any of the programs that are out there, but our legislature, just for example, this past session was very careful, very cautious not to spend any of the one-time COVID money on things that had a recurring long-term cost. We see other states that are launching teacher apprenticeships spending massive amounts of one-time money launching their teacher apprenticeships with no plan for sustainability. So we're, we're being a lot more cautious in that. Uh, we've had several meetings with Dr. Mackey and his staff now, and uh, we believe that we should have something ready to roll out in the fall of this upcoming school year, so a little less than a year from now, that will be um, training high-quality teachers. It will be sustainable. It will create new paths for people to get into teacher uh, education. programs in an affordable way um, and again left out of our improvements in the workforce so really excited about that opportunity and, and there'll be a lot more to come on that in the near future speaking of the near future uh, our office not only handles registered apprenticeship but we also are charged with expanding and promoting the use of all forms of work-based learning across the state we are uh, launching our second annual um, work-based learning regional best practices series that actually starts tomorrow in Gadsden is the first one. If you were uh, paying any attention to this last year, you saw we had seven regional sets of best practices and then they are competing for the governor's seal of excellence to be statewide best practice winners. 
that was extremely popular and well received last year. So we're repeating that. The goal is to identify high quality work based learning programs from across the state, hold them up so that one, they get the attention and the recognition that they deserve so that it can help their particular program expand. But from a state perspective, it is also equally or maybe more important for us to hold those up as learning opportunities so that somebody can look at that program, see how it was established, and then be able to carry that learning home to whatever area they're in and recreate that. Uh, we call it rip off and duplicate, R&D. We don't want everybody having to reinvent the wheel every single time. We have extremely successful, high-quality work-based learning in the state, and we're trying to bring an opportunity to bring that to scale. If you have not uh, registered for those events, the regional events, the dates are here on the screen. Um, if you uh, go to, uh, if you're on Twitter, go to my Twitter account. That's, uh, I'll, I'll put that on the last slide here in a minute, at Laney Works, and you can find the links to register for any of these. If you don't have time to register, that's okay. They start at nine o'clock in the morning at these places. Shoot me an email, a text or whatever. Let us know you're coming. We'd be glad to have you come and participate. Uh, these are going to be great events. We've got some really outstanding regional best practices, and each of those regional best practices will present, and then we'll be selecting from those the statewide winners. Very tentatively, but I do want you to at least pencil it in lightly on your calendar right now. Um, our plan, let me look at my dates again, our plan for the statewide event is April 5th, 6th, and 7th. Right now, we're, we, we haven't gotten any, you know, all the hotel contracts and all that stuff worked out yet. It's very hard to find meeting space in the state of Alabama for large conferences, but we're looking at Mobile for April 5th, 6th, and 7th, and so that'll be a great opportunity over in the spring for you to come and hear from our statewide winners. We also are, this all started with a grant from the governor's office through the National Governors Association, and we will be inviting some of our uh, state cohort participants from other states to come and maybe present some breakout sessions about cool, innovative things they're doing in their state. So it might be a good opportunity for you to come and learn about that. Uh, obviously, you're looking at PowerPoint, so you can't click on these links, but if you want to register for one of these, shoot me a message in the chat or send me an email or send me a text or look me up on Twitter or whatever. There's all my contact information. Uh, get a hold of me if you want to come to one of those regional events. So that's what I've got today, Chairman McCartney. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Josh. Great uh, update report. Uh, Mr. Wade, the floor is yours. Good morning, and uh, thank you for including me today. And I actually appreciate the fact that you put me last, and uh, because I was able to hear some really excellent things that are going on in workforce and education, and uh, it leads into what uh, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about this morning. Uh, as, as the chairman said, uh, I, I have a uh, I have about 30 years in economic development, so I'm going to be approaching what I'm going to say from that standpoint. You know, right now we have a serious workforce issue in Alabama, and uh, you've heard some wonderful things this morning about how we're trying to address those. And I'm going to talk about something that I hope uh, will do that as well. And of course, Nick, I'm sure we'll talk about the governor's goal uh, of 500,000 workers by 2025. And we've got a long way to go, but we've got some excellent things that are going on to try to address that and meet that goal. Inside the Alabama Community College system, there was a foundation that we decided to revamp. And uh, we have uh, completely moved it out of the uh, community college system. Patty Houston is our executive director. It's called the Pass for Success Foundation. And the, the goal of the foundation is to remove barriers that people have to get into training, into certification, into uh, apprenticeship programs, whatever. We want to remove those barriers that are keeping them on the sideline. You know, we, uh, we seem to be really excited about our unemployment rate, but to be perfectly honest, that really doesn't mean I won't say anything, but it doesn't give the picture of what's out there. The labor force participation rate, 43% of the workforce age Alabamians are sitting on the sideline, 43%. And we're 45th in the country in terms of that particular 
to the statistic. And as an economic developer and those that I know are trying to expand uh, jobs in Alabama, bring new jobs in Alabama, they are always asked about, can you supply the workforce that I need? Can you supply the workers that I need? So we have to focus on the fact that we have a lot of people who are sitting on the sidelines. Now, how do we get them off the sideline? I was challenged by the chancellor of the community college system a couple of months ago to figure out how do we move people from the couch to the career? And quite honestly, we haven't figured it out yet. We're working on it. But we've also, as we've gone through this process, we've found that we have some barriers. Now, we're going to roll the foundation out in the first quarter of 2023. And it's going to say to potential uh, people who want to get a certification, who want to learn a skill and move into the workforce, that if you've got a child care issue, if you've got a tuition issue, if you have a transportation issue, if you have other barriers that are keeping you on the sidelines, we wanna take steps to solve that for you. And so our, uh, what, we, what we're trying to do, I think is absolutely wonderful, but the problem is you take two of those issues, childcare and transportation, and as we've gotten into this, what we've learned is that, uh, let's take childcare. Uh, I was told in one particular county that, Neil, you're going to roll out a, an offer and you're going to say, if you want to, uh, to get a certification, if you want to get training, we'll take care of your child care. Well, if there are not child care seats available, then we've made a hollow offer. And what we're finding is in too many areas of the state, there are people who are actually waiting on a wait list to get, uh, to get a seat for their, for their children so that they can get training and they can learn a skill. So one of the things we're gonna be working, Nick uh, Moore and has been extremely helpful in this and the transportation issue in let's figure out how we can set up a pilot program uh, and begin to learn how we can involve faith-based community, how we can involve local entrepreneurs, and we can address the uh, child care issue and, and create more child care seats available so that when we go out and say, okay, we'll take that issue away from you, we can deliver on it. If we can't deliver, then we've made a hollow offer. And transportation is the same thing. And what we've learned is that there are bus systems, city bus systems, county bus systems that go around and take people from assistance facilities or whatever, take them shopping. And in some cases, they're already taking students to a community college or to a learning facility so that they can get these skills. And so we're reaching out and we are really doubling our efforts to work with these bus systems all over the state and this foundation can go in and basically say, okay, we'll help subsidize uh, that system if it will get more opportunities for people to, uh, to, to get this kind of uh, opportunity to go get the training. So I, I think what I'm, what I'm trying to say is we're gonna, we, we've got a wonderful foundation here, but we've got some challenges that we've got to work through so that when we offer these opportunities to do away with the barriers, to basically say to the, that 43% out there, you can get off the couch, you can get off the sidelines and we're gonna help you do that. We wanna make sure that we deliver in that particular, uh, in, in that instance. You know, we've done some wonderful things in economic development over the last uh, de few decades. And there's some wonderful opportunities that are gonna come our way from an economic development standpoint. But if we don't have the workforce, if we're not able to provide those skills, then we're not gonna be able to be a competitive state. And we wanna be a competitive state and we wanna bring in those jobs, not just in the 
around the interstates, not in the larger cities. We want to make sure that we are solving these issues in Alabama's rural areas as well. Uh, I served as director of the Alabama Development Office, which is now Secretary of Commerce. I did that for eight years. And I remember the focus was on bringing and attracting industry into Alabama. And we focused on the interstates. And I guess I have done a 180 degree turn and I understand if we don't focus on the entire state, we're not gonna have a thriving state. We're not gonna meet those goals that we need to meet. And we're not gonna solve the issues that people have to go get a good job and be able to provide for their family. So uh, my objective this morning is to let you know that this foundation has a wonderful board of directors, has some wonderful support, and uh, it's gonna roll out in uh, the first quarter of uh, 2023. Uh, we're starting with a pretty good level of seed money, but we've got a long way to go in terms of raising some significant dollars so that we can uh, attack these programs. But this foundation is set up strictly to take away barriers from people who want to get a skill and want to get into the workforce. Thanks, John. Thank you, Neil. Appreciate that update. And look forward to seeing y'all success in the near future and uh, look forward to working with you. Thank you. Well, it looks like we've overrun our time uh, today by about a minute. And I've talked to Nick in the background and he said our labor force uh, update is uh, hasn't had any number of changes since last month. So we're going to skip his report today and just say thank you for joining us again this month. And we look forward to having you with us uh, at 9 a.m. on November 14th for the Alabama Workforce Council's next uh, monthly update. In the meantime, have a safe week. And